So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Downing, and I am uh, the creator of Box Seat Baseball. And I think I started down that road in the mid-90s, and then me and my brother, my brother has done all the programming, he's done all the all the IT work on the game. So even in the early stages, it started out as a board game, uh, evolved into strictly a PC game. And then in the early 2000s, I brought it back to being a board game, and eventually we, we stopped supporting the PC version, uh, I want to say maybe five to seven years ago, um, just due to time constraints and job changes, etc., um, Bill is working on reviving the PC version, um, so look for something new on that soon. Um, but today, uh, this this video is all about, and my first video I've ever done, so please be kind. Um, this video is regarding the Under the Hood version. Um, Josh Nelson put out a very a couple of nice uh, videos on the Easy Play version, so I think that's been covered. Um, and if not, I can always uh, help in that regard if somebody puts out a request. But uh, I want to cover the Under the Hood version because there is very little uh, on the Under the Hood version. I think what is out there is uh, kind of a PC converted, somebody playing through PDF. So I wanted to give you um, some background to the game, um, some gameplay examples, and um, show you some tips uh, to maybe make it a little more playable. It's more, in, what, involved, I guess you would say, than the Easy Play version, although the Easy Play version um, contains the same statistical accuracy of Under the Hood. Under the Hood, instead of something that would... Uh, a couple of major differences. Uh, Under, Under the Hood does not use a flip card... Easy Play uses the flip card to greatly expedite the flow of the game, so I know that's where it hits most people's sweet spot is the flow. So Easy Play has definitely been the more popular of the two. Under the Hood is strictly uh, um, dice and charts, uh, which for me that's kind of been uh, where I've leaned because that's just how I grew up was dice and charts, and um, I still like the interaction between the dice results and the charts, um, but just a personal preference, and like I say, um, Easy Play was by far the most popular and does have the better game flow. Um, UTH advantages, again, no flip cards, and um, just there is more dice references, m many more chart references. Uh, but it will give you uh, the background of how we're getting to the revolts on some of the flip card, and then also the batter, pitcher, and our action mechanism has one more step to it, which, again, for most people, that would be a negative. For others, they would enjoy that step. So it, U, UTH has a limited audience, so to speak, but um, I think it could be very overwhelming for somebody who just takes a first peek at the game or just looks at the manual. It's something that you need to play uh, frequently, um, and then your game flow will increase greatly, and especially as you memorize results um, for fielders. Uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So what the plan is here, um, after that introduction, I'm going to go ahead and give you a real, real quick uh, background to the player cards, look at some of the charts, and, um, and then we'll go ahead and play a couple innings, and if nothing comes up, if, if something does not come up in those couple innings that I think needs to be covered, I'll go ahead and just set those up and, and have that uh, do a run-through just with some makeup die results. So let's start with the player cards, and let's start with the pitcher's card. Um, so this is, if I can get it separated or shown properly here, I'm showing you Dave McNally here. Um, and this is, I'll be using the 71 Orioles and the uh, 71 Pirates, just like the demo version that I have um, out there. So as we look at McNally's card, I wish it would focus a little better. Uh, I don't like the focus on it. Um, I do not like the focus. So anyway, we'll we'll try to work with this as is. Let me see how the charts come in. Yeah, I think the charts are good enough. 
going to just need to pull back a little bit. Maybe McNally would come in a little clearer. That's a little better, I think. So uh, McNally, if you look at the top, the upper left, you have his name. Up, up on top, it's uh, how, which arm he throws from. And then to the right of that will show you whether he's a ground ball, a fly ball, or a normal pitcher, meaning the, the type of out results he gets. Um, and then below his name, you see his air rating of 16. Um, he bats right. He has a hitter's card as opposed to a generic hitting card. Pitchers who had less than 10 at-bats would have a generic pitch, uh, pitcher's hitting card. So in the older seasons, almost most of the pitchers have a regular hitting card. Um, so anyway, most, most of the pitchers do have a uh, regular hitter's card. Then you have his games. God, I wish this would come up. Let me try picking it up. Maybe it would be better that way. Sorry about this. This does not focus as good as I would like it. Um, anyway, we have his games, his games started, his innings pitched, um, his ERA, his win-loss, his saves, his uh, level 1 fatigue, a level 2 fatigue. Level 1 is strictly a, a batter's face fatigue. Level 2 will weigh in uh, hits and walks will make him fatigue at a quicker level. Um, they are rated higher as far as uh, fatiguing a pitcher um, as opposed to an out bat, uh, batter result. Um, then you have an SBR and an SBF. SBR is the stolen base, um, the successful stolen base rate against him. Um, so you can see McNally is a minus three. I just, I'm not happy with how this is appearing. One sec here. Okay, I think that's fairly decent. So SBR minus three, SBF of minus two. Uh, the, the frequency is just how often he was stolen. Negative numbers are better than positive numbers. Uh, you have an early and a late rating. Um, the early rating uh, from A to E, A being he was uh, more efficient in getting uh, uh, and preventing hits in the first inning, and it's for the first inning only for starting pitchers, and E would be the worst rating. So McNally was a slow starter, basically. Late rating, uh, so only for starting pitchers, is for, is for how they perform from the seventh inning on. You have a wild pitch rating. Um, you have a pickoff balk rating. And uh, I'm converting all the cards to com uh, add a new hit-by-pitch rating. Uh, but I won't go into that on this video. I might do a separate one once I get all the cards updated with the hit-by-pitch on it. There's also on the website, there is a download for the hit-by-pitch ratings for each season and a guide on how to use it as opposed to... Uh, the old system was you just use their hit rating to check to see if the pitcher blocked it. Here we have a separate rating for the hit by pitch for the pitchers. Um, then you can see his home run ratings are below that. Uh, versus lefties, McNally was a minus three. Versus righties, a plus two. Um, you go down below that, he has a hit rating, walks rating, and K rating, all rated separately for versus left handers and versus right handers. Uh, the more Results populated on the rows for the hits and the walks. The more, the more uh, successful that pitcher was in preventing hits and preventing walks. So those numbers will turn into those play results would take a potential walk or hit and turn it into an out. Um, you can see that the hits go down to a minus three. The walks to a minus two. The walks there's also an EWR rating, which is an extreme walk uh, rating. Um, that's for pitchers who really virtually walk no one and then you would refer to the red die when a batter would just get a straight uh, walk result which we'll delve into in a little bit when I get into the gameplay uh, the K's rating in this instance it's a little bit just the opposite of the hits and the walks you want those to be not to be populated um, because they will that means the pitcher is not overriding a batter uh, 
a batter K result, which would be a strikeout. So this would be turning a strikeout off the batter's card to a ground ball or fly ball or pop out or line out. Um, so anyway, uh, and then the Ks can also be populated into the walks, into the hits where there are play result number, uh, play results uh, for those who are really are high strikeout pitchers. Okay, so that's the pitcher's card. Um, the batter's card, and we've got Dave Cash here. again to get this a little bit better than what it is doing for me. I don't know why. Okay, on the batter's card, again, if you look at the upper, you have his name, and to the right of that you have which side of the plate he hits from, right, left, or both, and then you would have whether he's a ground ball hitter, a fly ball hitter, or a norm. Uh, just like the pitchers. Um, Cash, you have his positions below his name. He played second base and third base. He was rated, uh, the F rating is his range rating. That's uh, He's rated twos for both second and third. You have air rating. He was a 17 air for second base and a nine for third base. Um the second ratings on all these, if so if Cash would have played three or four positions, then those three or four positions, uh, so the second through the fourth, would all be the second ratings. They're combined into that second rating. So you would normally only see two ratings, uh, and the second one is for all his secondary positions. The first one's before the slant um, or the backslash is his first position ratings. Okay. Um, So then we would look at, below that, you'll see if his verse left, verse right, um, you'll have a stats line, which has his um, at bats, his batting average, and then his home runs and his RBIs, which were a total for, for both. Batting average and at bats are just strictly verse left-handers. Uh, below that is a hit rating that is used for the easy play version, an SP rating that is used for the easy play version, but you could also use it for reference in UTH just to see if the guy was good with runners in scoring position. That'll give you an idea. Minus three was the worst. Plus three is the best. Um, the hit and run rating, uh, again, A to D, I believe, and A being the best, D being the worst. Um, a bunt rating is the standard... Um, Excellent to poor, five ratings, and then a hit number there on the end. And that is 70. It's 70. <laughs> Jesus. It's not just cooperating for me. Try again to get this better focused. Okay, I think that's the best focus I've had so far. So he has a hit rating of 70, um, and that will come into play when I go through the uh, batter-pitcher uh, interaction, which we go through gameplay. But basically, uh, there can be a couple of sets of numbers. The first sets of numbers are what we would call a batter auto-hit. So if he gets a red play result, you would uh, check the green and... Um, the green and the red die... Um, to see if, if that they are greater than or equal to that, and if that's the case, then he gets a hit automatically. You don't check the pitcher to see if he blocks it, and those are thought of as uh, hits where he hit a quality uh, pitcher's pitch. So the lower that number, the more, uh, the better the the hitter. Basically, it means that he will he will get a lot of hits off even quality pitchers. Um, the uh, and that there's a secondary letter in parentheses. Let me find one here. Well, this is really there. We go. Okay, here's Jose Pagan. So Jose Pagan. Let's again. Here he is. Jose Pagan. Like if you look at his left, uh, his left figure there. Right there. Let me get back where you can see it. There's a 74 there, and um, in parentheses, that means for, for scoring positions, 
uh, scoring position situations only. So you would refer to that number uh, to make sure it's his number is the green red die value is if it's greater than or equal to that number that's an automatic out. So that that if if a batter has those numbers that means he was he did not hit well with runners in scoring position, and so those override the first set of numbers, the 92. So with runners and if the bases were in non-scoring position situations, and you had a red batter result you would look at that first number. You would disregard the second number um, because it's as a non-scoring position. So if if Pagan in this situation had a 90, if you had a green red die value of 92 or above, then that would be a uh, auto hit or a hit off a quality pitcher, a quality pitch. Uh, with scoring position, if the if the red green die value was 74 or above, then that would be a scoring position out. Um, so we'll roll through some of that. Um, and you can see then below that are his numbers versus right-handers. Um, and the same scenario. And then also above those numbers, um, you will see a, a power ranking um, for both first left and first right. And those can come into play in different scenarios, sometimes on range Range plays where outs turn into hits. Sometimes if, he, if he's getting a scoring, if he was good with runners in scoring position, uh, he'll have some some scoring position hit results that will be built into the play results, and you would use that power to see what type of hit. So a uh, more chance of hitting a home run or extra base hit. Okay, and then below that is all the play results. Again, separate results for versus lefties versus righties. You'll see... Um, Basically, all the red results require the start of the hit check routine, which we will run through, and the blue results, for the most part, are outs, um, are checks against the pitcher card for walks or strikeouts. Um, you can have some. You have some that are deep fly results. Uh, there is a DFO result, and that is, no matter the situation, you would do a deep fly check against the pitcher, um, we'll go through one of those. Then you have a DFL and a DFM. DFL, you would refer to the red die value, and a 0 through 2, you would have a deep fly check, and a 3 through 9 would be a, I'm looking at DFM, or I'm sorry, I don't see a DFL. Oh, there's a DFL. So there's a DFL right there. So DFL 1. So um, that would be a Deep fly, if it's 0 to 2, uh, deep fly check, and if it's 3 to 9, it would be a long fly ball out. Uh, DFA, DFM is just one level up, um, so it is 0 to 6. It would be a deep uh, deep fly check, and 7 to 9 would be a long fly ball out. Um, Pagan was not good in scoring position, as you can see, with the negative results. Um, but if you look at Manny Sanguian here... You can see Sanguian actually was a three if you look at his easy play rating, which means he had some scoring position results here. So, like, here's one here, uh, this NF2 um, SPH result. So that would mean with if, the runner, if there are not runners in scoring position, it's a normal fly ball out. If there are runners in scoring position, he, he has a scoring position hit, and there's no pitcher's check to that. It's an automatic scoring position hit. And then you would refer to the scoring position hit chart using his power up here, the weak, um, uh, and refer that to the chart, and then you would roll the dice, and we'll run through one of those. Okay, so I tried to run through that fairly quickly because you could spend a lot of time, and I really want to get to a gameplay example. Uh, let me get the cards back in order here. Clemente went. Okay, moving these back. Okay, quick look at the chart. So when you get the game, you're going to get, I call it a trifold because it used to come all linked together in three pieces for UTH, and it does for easy play. But for UTH, I've now separated the hits page because I found that it's just much easier to play if you separate that out and have it standing in front of you then you, there's no flipping. You don't need to flip to that page. It's right there in front of you. So that's why it's, it's a tri, It's still called a trifold, but really it's a bifold with a separate legal um, 
separate legal page. Um, and then you would also have the ballpark card here. We'll get into that during the gameplay. Um, you can see the ballparks are rated for home runs for the different fields. Um, then you would get the wall distance, the, the distance down the lines, the wall heights, which can come into play in some um, with some range plays, the descriptions of whether or not he got robbed of a home run or whether or not it went off the wall, um, et cetera. So the, the, wall hearts, the wall heights are not just there for decoration. They can't actually come into the gameplay. Then for the optional ballpark effects, which I use, um, the ballparks are rated for singles, doubles, and triples. And so we'll get into the range plays in a, a little. I'll go through a whole sequence, so we'll see those. But you can see the, the ballparks are rated for plus four to minus four, um, and it's pretty um, apparent that uh, you know the results are the results that are sitting on them are going to tell you whether or not it's a good park for that. So, for instance, you look at the singles; you can see it's split right up the middle. Uh, half of them are singles, half of them are outs. Doubles you have more outs than doubles. Triples you have more triples than uh, outs. So you can say it's a good triple park, not a good double park, and an average singles park. Um, then you get a ballpark picture uh, below that. So there's Memorial Stadium here from 1971. That's the ballpark card. Um, then you will have some loose charts. Um, so stuff that you don't reference as often as you do the other. Uh, you have optional rules. There's an advanced starting pitcher fatigue adjustment, which I highly recommend, especially the outstanding stuff. I think it's a nice addition to the game. Um, it will you will look at how the pitcher has performed over the first four innings. You also take into context how good of a pitcher was he. So if he was overperforming and he was a mediocre pitcher, it would be less of a uh, barrier to uh, get above than it would be for an outstanding pitcher um, because the outstanding pitcher normally pitches at a high level. Um, so that is that. I'm not going to delve deep into that, um, but you can look at the chart and see that. There is an auto steal system, which I will get into when we get into the gameplay, which uses uh, the original red dive roll. So no re-roll required to see if the pitcher, to see if a base runner is attempting a steal uh, using the auto steal. Uh, <clears throat> some rules for guarding the lines. On the back side, there is a home run locator chart. Um, and this will... Um, Again, very optional on this one, but I like it. Uh, you, it takes an extra die roll, and you check. It will pinpoint. So if a home run was the left field, this you can pinpoint was it was down the line, was it straightaway left, was it a little off to left center. Same thing with center and right. And for then you, the, the other die is used to see how far it cleared the fence, and you use the batter's power to help define that. Um, then you have some optional rules that you can use for the weather effects, and I will do a weather example here uh, in a minute. Um, so that's that page. You have an advanced errors charts for both the infielders and the outfielders, or yes, and the outfielders, and also for the fly balls. So you have outfielder hit errors, and you have outfielder fly ball errors. This will def give you a better description of how the air was committed, but more importantly, it will also give you the base advance, potential base advance, which will weigh into um, the batters or the base runners, uh, base runner or batter, depending on who you're looking at, uh, what his uh, BR rating is. Um, that's that page. And then you have three pages of wild play charts, uh, two for the standard base situations, and then, well, actually, it's four because they're uh, it's front and back of the two pages. And then a sacrifice bunt wild play chart, which you would be uh, sent to from the trifolds when you're attempting a bunt. Um, so there's that. So on the trifolds, you basically, you're, you're spending a lot of time on three pages. And as I have them laid out here, um, you have the ground balls chart, which I lay right in front of me because you're going to use that quite frequently. To the left, we'll give you the base advance for the different situations, um, which you will memorize most instances fairly quickly. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and if you follow basic um, baseball, what, common sense for the most part, 
but it does. There are some situations where you'll be looking at a ba uh, batter's base running rating, depending upon the outs, depending upon whether the ball was hit to the left side or the right side of the infield, um, whether or not a, ba a batter was the infield was in, were they halfway, um, was the batter was the base runner going on contact? All that will come into play, and then below those you'll have the different ground ball double play uh, check charts. There's a hard grounder and a regular grounder and a slow grounder, uh, which a slow grounder home really should be renamed just a ground ball home because that chart there is basically for plays at the plate, um, not just on slow grounders, but it can be also referred to from hard grounders and routine grounders. Uh, it'll tell you to go to that in those areas, but still it really more adequately should be just named a ground ball home coach decision chart. Um, and below that, there's some notes on the different checks, what you need to do. There's an infield in hit check. Off to the right is where you're going to be spending a lot of time. This is the different rows, which will give you the fielders. Um, and it will give you, and you're going to be using the, for the most part, you'll be using the red 10-sided die to go down those rows to tell you who, who the fielder was for that type of uh, play result. And then also there's some asterisks in there, which will tell you where an out was made. Uh, to third base, second base, or shortstop, and two outs. If there's an asterisk behind it, it means there was a force out at second. If there's two asterisks on the runner on a ground ball to third, that means he made a force out at third for the third out. Um, and if you see it on the first baseman, that means it was a three to one put out. If there is not an asterisk on a ground ball to the first baseman and the out was at first, then it's a uh, just a three unassisted. So that's what that's used. That's the ground ball chart. Uh, one more below that is the line out double play check chart. So if you have a line out with runners on, less than two outs, you come down here, use your original black die. We get a little closer. You can see it has a, after the line out double play check, you see it R-I-G-B-D, meaning you use the original black die result and reference it below uh, with the fielder and the base runner situation to see if there was an actual double play. Okay, on the fly ball out chart, um, basically fly balls. There's also some coaches' decisions, but you'll see that you have a deep fly row, deep fly one and two. Then you have a long fly ball, and you have a normal fly and a short fly uh, columns. And below those, you have um, a deep fly check chart. You have a fly ball manager's decision chart. You have a back base runner um Check to see if he advances. If you if you had a manager's decision play at a base, you would check this chart to see if the back base runner advances, if the defense decided to make a play on that runner. Um, to the right of those are the are the air charts, and I'll run through a, an example of those, but you're using, um, get a little closer, you're using the white, black, and green die values to uh, on these charts to see whether or not an error was committed. Um, and you use the, the fielder's air rating um, along with those die values. And we'll run through an example on that. Um, and then off to the very left are the different, the different um, coaches' decision charts for hits. So you have a singles and doubles coaches' decisions. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. On the bottom, there's a chance whether or not a trailing base runner was thrown out um, on the play on the coach's decision play, and there's also a possible air check on the coach's decision play if the play's at the plate. Um, the other major chart is the hit chart that you that I have standing up. Um, I set it down for the example. So you can see you have TP1, DB1, TP for triple, DB for double. The, the twos and the ones and the values after those, well, you will be getting those from the batter's play, re, play results or the pitcher's play results and that's giving you the direction. Um, one is a left-handed pull. Two is a normal. I mean, I'm sorry. One is someone who pulls to left field. Uh, two is an what an average right-handed batter hits to. Three is an average left-handed batter, the side of the field that he normally hits to. And a four is for a right-handed uh, right field pull, someone who pulls to right field, to the right side. So anyway, so... There's all the re hit results, and the same concept that you would take the play result, the, the numerical value at the end of the play result, 
and you would go to the correct column. So if it's a single, you then you use the play result, uh, the uh, numerical value of the play result on the end to go to the correct column, and then use the red 10-sided die, uh, and then it will give you a hit result, and the hit result will tell you the field, what how the hit was what type of hit it was, meaning, um, so like if you look at the SN1 and the five, um, the five row there, you see it was hit to center field and it was a hard single. And then down, if you go to where there's runners on, you start getting, so this is the runner on first columns, you'll see that there's base advances um, giving in those same, with those same results. So you can look in that same, that same row and you can see uh, whether or not there was a base event. So, for instance, this is a runner on first um, and was hit to left field. So if we go further up, this is an SN1, and it, it would have been a single to left. It hit an average difference distance from the outfielder. And the R1, which is the, the runner on, uh, donates the runner on first, um, with if it, the parentheses results is for two outs, uh, and if it's not in parentheses, it's for zero outs or one out. So if there's zero outs or one outs, it took an A-plus runner. Uh, base BR rating of the runner on first to get to third. If there's two outs, it just took an A-BR rating. Um, and it tells you there would go to third. So that is that. You'll see some results are split. Uh, so you'll have to know whether or not it's a right-handed. So for instance, here on the DB3... If it's a right-handed batter, it's a double into the left field gap. If it's a left-handed batter, it's a double down the right field line. <clears throat> All right, so that is the singles charts, and I'll stick that back up standing up for the gameplay. Um, the back, since I'm there, the back of this is the range plays, which we will run through. Um, there's descriptions for range plays made on hit play results. So this is when it was going to be a hit, but due to an outstanding play by the fielder, it was the hit was taken away. So then you will use the original black die, go to the type of hit, and then see what happened. Um, so I'll give you one example here. Uh, so we had a, let's say we had a ground ball to the shortstop, and right here, and we had a black die, original black die. There's no re-rolls. I've tried to eliminate almost all re-rolls uh, with, with this version. So that's the part that I've tried to increase playability by getting rid of re-rolls. Many, most instances, you're going to be using your original dice roll for just about everything, with exceptions for certain type of air checks, uh, the manager's decisions, and the deep fly checks. Those, are the, your, those will be your primary re-rolls. Um, but anyway, okay, back to this result on a single for to ground ball single that was robbed by the shortstop. He, he will I'll show you a complete range play. You would go use the black die value was five shortstop. You see fielder ranges deep into the hole and makes perfect off balance throw to first. The first base occupied, he got the force at second only. So that's how that is used. Then you have an uh, hits on outs play results, and this is would be a blue range result that would actually be uh, shown on the on a batter's card with a play result that begins with an RNG. And then when you did the range check, he did not make the play. So you would come to uh, this chart and you would take the type of out here. And then you would, uh, in certain instances, you break it down by the fielder. Um, in this instance, you would re- if, if a re-roll is required, you would use, um, you would re-roll the, um, you would re-roll the, the uh, sorry, here, uh, re-roll the black die. Um, so anyway, so it tells you as you get closer, so for instance, we had a normal fly, uh, and the outfielder did not make the play, it turned into a single, fly ball single, with zero or one out, there's a one base advance, with two outs, it's a two base advance. Hard grounders turn into a ground ball single. Same thing with a routine grounder. Slow grounder would turn into an infield single. Um, so it gives you your base advance. It tells you what the out, the previous out turned into due to poor play by the fielder, and that and that is that. Um, so below that is a little further breakdown on long fly balls. You can actually have those turn into uh, triples or doubles or home runs, depending upon the batter's power. And then there is a re-roll involved on that one. Uh, and then for ground ball, 
um, checks you could, if it was through the, if the play was a shortstop or the second baseman, turned into a ground ball single into the outfield due to his poor play, you have to figure out which outfielder, so you use the original black die and the batter, which way he hits right or left, will tell you whether it went to center or left or right. Um, down on the bottom, um, here is uh, some more breakdown of getting to the fielder. I won't go too much detail because we're going pretty slow here. <laughs> and then there's an optional fielder effect on optional ballpark effects. Um, this is something I definitely use. So on the range check, sometimes you will get a BP number, which means you will be using the ballpark effect. And what I what this does, it takes into account not only the ballpark, uh, but also the fielder. So it'll move that number you get off of the range check chart, which I'll show you in a sec, and it will move it up or down, uh, which will basically either increase the possibility or, out or de decrease the possibility of, of the fielder making the play. And here is the actual range check chart. You're using the original green-red die um, values here off to the right, and you're checking against and then it will give you what might, what happened. Dean did not make the play, made the play. If it says like less than four, that means he made the play. If his rating was a one, two, or three, if it's a four, he did not make the play. And then sometimes you see the BP numbers. That was the number I was just referring to. In that instance, you would use the optional ballpark effects and then take that number, adjust for the fielder range rating, which is was right in here, and then take that to the actual ballpark card um, here for those columns and see whether or not so we'll go through a play on that um, that is those charts uh, then you have uh, some miscellaneous game charts your stolen base charts you have a rare play chart uh, which can lead to a wild play so a little bit different than most games so I have a rare play which is just uh, outs that aren't as frequent as regular balls hit to the uh, infielders or the outfielders. So uh, balls hit to the pitcher, uh, short fly balls because there's not a lot of those on the batter's card. Uh, but you have a one in six chance of getting a wild play, and then you would go to those wild, loose wild play charts. Um, the rest of them are pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then you have bunt charts. Um and you have a scoring position hit chart when you have a SP result, SPH result. You have a fatigue pitcher chart, and you have a special situations chart, and then a pass ball wild pitch check. Okay, um, one last trifle, and then we're going to get to gameplay. So then up on the, uh, the last trifle, back last trifle, there's an advanced infield single. So when you have an infield single, I highly recommend using this chart. Um, you want to uh, re-roll the green die, depending upon which fielder made the play. That'll lead you to a numerical, or a, uh, sorry, an alpha value. So for instance, the, the third baseman here, if we would have rolled a four on the green die, it gives me a D. Take a D over here, and it says the grounder smashed off the fielder's body and retrieved in the shallow outfield. Um, and then the two on the end will take you back down here to the base advance. So much more detailed infield single, and I think it's a lot of fun personally. Uh, then you have an OFCK range check. This is, as, as opposed to a strict out hit range check, this is more of a base advance range check. So in other words, bad play making it, turning a single into a double uh, by an outfielder or, or vice versa. Something that was going to be a double turned into a single to outstanding. Uh, range basically done by the outfielder and you would re-roll the green red die for that so this would be one type of range check that would require a re-roll sometimes the outfielder arm will come into play as to whether or not um, there is an extra base advance or not and so the, you also get some z base situations which can lead some to some unique results uh, you can have a guy scoring from first on a single depending upon his base running rating you can have a guy not scoring from second on a double um, again, depending upon his base running range. So get cover some of those uh, rare base advance situations. There's the arm check chart, uh, and there's a norm uh, base advance chart below. Or I'm sorry, that's an OFCK. So that's a first to third uh, manager's decision chart. 
Um, and then I hit and run chart here on the bottom. I'm not going to run through all that, but there's different... If you call a hit and run, then certain play results can be changed. Uh, so, and then also the base runner advance can uh, will be affected by what happened. High E prevent double plays, <coughs> possible strikeout throw them out situations. Um, it can, it will reduce the chance of turning a home run, knocking it down to a single. Since the batter was concentrating on a hit and run and not looking to drive the ball out of the ballpark. Um, it will decrease strikeouts, but also decrease walks. So uh, various adjustments there. And then off to the right, we're going to do this in one second. We're going to do a roll. This is the quick weather guide. So when we get the weather to start a game, uh, I think I've covered it, believe it or not. Okay, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to play a couple of innings. I'll go ahead and do a weather roll just to uh, show you how that works. This is going to be interesting with one hand here. Um, let's see if I can cover this like so. Okay, let me sit down. Okay, so we're going to do a weather roll here. And this we're saying this is in... October, so you would use the September weather because we're going to say this is World Series Game One here, and we're going the first the first set of numbers. Let me go up a little higher here to show you. So the first column here, the die numbers, and you're going to get the game time temperature. I'll show you how that is done, and then you will re-roll again and get the wind direction. And then re-roll again and get the velocity uh, of that wind direction. Okay, so let's do a September roll here. I'm going to have to be talented to do this with my left hand. So I normally roll. Green die went askew here. I'll be right back. <sighs> Okay, so I use the green die normally here. I throw the black, white. You need three die. You need one ten-sided die. I use the green just because it's smaller and a little easier to handle than the big red die. So we'll go ahead and roll, and you'll see it's a 64 and a 3. Um, so with 64, which is right there, falls in the 44 to 65 column, and means the temperature is 83 degrees. But you use the three as a variable, and we go over to my quick weather guide on the trifle, you see the three is a minus one. And uh, so it's actually going to be uh, 82 degrees. So 82 degrees will have an effect. Actually, it has no effect on the, on the temp But certain temperatures can have an effect on the pitcher's fatigue rating. So if you had, here are the different adjustments. Uh, let me go down a little bit here. Here we go. So, God, it just does not want to focus right. So right here is the starting pitcher fatigue adjustment. And if it's a day game and the temperature is above 90, then you would subtract 4 from his fatigue rating. If it's a night game and it's above 90, you subtract 2. And if it's for both night or day, it doesn't matter. If your temperature is between 56 and 77, you would add two to his fatigue. So good good conditions for the pitcher to pitch in. You add two to his fatigue. This instance, we have 83, and I'll just call this a day game. And um, so we have no effect on the pitcher fatigue with the, with the, uh, with the um, temperature. So sorry, but it's moving around here. So now we'll do the second roll, which is going to be for the wind direction. And I've got a 12 and a 1. Actually, I'm sorry, for this one you do not need the green die, just the black and the white for the wind direction. So the wind direction here with a 12 is a 7. And that would be... 
going back to the trifold, that's in from right. So now you see, okay, the wind's blowing in from right. How much is it blowing? Uh, in this instance, there's only one value here for September. So all you need to roll is a 10-sided die because you're not going to have, it's, it's already 8. So now you see what the variable is, 4. And the 4 means there is uh, no effect. So it just stays at, at, at 8 miles an hour. Okay. So depending upon what it was doing, um, I think I said it was left or right. Um, I don't remember what I got the first one. Yeah, it was left to, uh, yeah, I think it was left to right, right? So left to right, so it would be left to right at 8 miles an hour. Well, the wind to fly in deep, deep fix, if it was 8 miles per hour, would be a 1. You can see right there, wind effect on deep fly is 5 to 9 miles per hour. And this, it would be a 1 which means you would add one to deep flies, but this is a crosswind. So if you remember back in our optional rules that I showed earlier, a crosswind, you would cut the effect in half. Uh, so since it's a one and you, and, you, and, you round it, whoops, and you would round it conservatively, um, so it, it, there's no effect. Uh, if it was a two, if this would have been a two, if it, would have been, if it would have been 10 to 14 miles per hour and it was right to left, we would have had a minus one to, um, to left. I'm sorry, a minus one. If, it's, if the wind was blowing left to right, you would have a minus one to left and a plus one to right. Okay, I'm spending too much time on that. But um, anyway. So in this instance, we have an 8-mile-per-hour crosswind, but no effect. Um, so it doesn't. So there's no effect to the uh, deep flies. And I always write that on my score sheet along with the temperature. So I just put it up there in my score sheet box. Uh, and this was 8 miles an hour. All right. So that's the weather. Uh, so it can affect your deep fly routine, your deep fly checks, it can affect your pitcher fatigue. That's what the weather does. Uh, and for some seasons, you'll have, here's the weather chart. I, you know, this came in a comb, for most seasons, it's comb bound, but over the last five years, maybe with the new seasons, I now put this on the back of the ballpark card that I showed you earlier. So you would not have a separate book with the weather. You would just be on the back of the card. Depending on which season you have, you'll either have a comb bound book with the weather or to, or to be on the back of the ballpark card. Okay, let's play a little bit here. Get situated. Okay, we got Dave McNally facing Dave Cash. And so let's, you, now you have an option with UTH to roll, um, you can roll Five die, you can ride, you can roll four die, you can roll three die. I do not like re-rolls, so I try to eliminate those as much as possible. So if I now roll all five dies first. I know when I first released the version, I, I rolled four die. and only used the pitcher die, roll the pitcher die when I needed it. The pitcher die will be needed maybe 30%, uh, 35% of the time you'll need to roll that. But for me, I just assume do it all in one roll. So... I haven't really gone over the die, but you have a white, move it up here. You have the white, the black, the big red, a, a little 10 sided green, and an opaque pitcher die. Okay, so I roll all five. Um, on every at bat, you're going to need to use the white, black, and red. Um, so what I do is I focus on those three. Even though I roll all five, I will focus on those three. Um, and then the green die will come into play if there's an air check. If we get a zero E on the big red die, that denotes an air check. So then you would use the green die for the fielder. Otherwise, you're using the big red die for the fielder column on the trifolds. Um, and then the pitcher die is the last one there. Um, you can see it has different values. Let me get over there. 0, 3E, e, 1, A, B, minus 1. The A and the B come, 
come into play with the early late ratings. Also, if you're using the optional outstanding stuff, the A and the B come into play. R for range, the rest, uh, the rest uh, are references to the pitcher's hit columns when those numbers come up. Okay, let's start a couple of at-bats here, at least get started. So I'll roll here for... Okay, so this is, um, what I do is I grab the white, you cannot see me doing it, but I'll grab the white, the black, and the red die, and move it off to the side. So I focus on those, because those you're going to need every time. So I have a 61, it's uh, 61 and a 1, so the two six-sided die, reading white into black, and then red. So 61 and a 1. So I take this, you start with the batter's card. You go to the 61 on Mr. Cash. And McNally is a left-hander. So I have a DB2 versus the lefty. See the versus lefty column? You have a DB2. So we have a, we have a hit check here. The red results denote a hit check. So the first thing you do is then you will grab the green die and it will come into play. And you're going to read this as green die and red die, so it's 91. So you take that number, and you remember we go back to, as I explained earlier, the auto hit numbers. So you look at McNally's UTH hit number right there. It's a 70. And so anything 70 or above would be an auto hit, or he hit a quality pitcher's pitch, and he, that's what you have. Ninety-one would give him a uh, give him would make the red make it the red result a hit. So it is a DB two, and we use the one for the for the chart to get the fielder. So we have we'll go to the stand up chart here, and you would look up the DB two column. And a one with the bases empty. The first, the first row of results is for the bases empty, and we get a double down the left field line. So that's your first play result. So I'm going through this awful slow. You would, uh, you know, as you get the hang of it, you would flow through these pretty quickly. So we have a double for cash. Okay, so now let's talk about the auto steal chart. Since I have a runner on, um, pull that into play here. So since I have a runner on, you you always use you would use the auto steal column here. You use your original red die, so you would use the one value. And if it's a runner on, if you're trying, if, if it's a potential steal of second base, so the runner's on first. It's pretty easy to know what your SBF needs to be greater than. It's always one less than that red die value. Um, so if he was on first base, the, the, the one would be red. You would take it over here. It means he needs to have an SBF, combined SBF of zero or more to hit the steal. But he is on second base. So we look, so it would be a potential steal of second. So you look at the one value. And then you look at the black, the second, you also use the black die value. And you would say low, medium, or high, depending upon the black die. So if the low would be one or two, medium would be three or four, high would be five or six. It's given down below here, down here. So we have a one low. We have a one and a one. So a one and a one means he needs to be a plus one to attempt to steal a third base. Um, he is a zero. Cash is a has an SBF of zero. McNally has an SBF of minus two. So he doesn't. It has to be. He had to be greater than or equal to one. So he does not, He is not eligible to attempt a steal. You would only attempt it unless you get an asterisk result, a steal of of a third um, if there's one out. You do not attempt with zero or two through the auto steal unless you have an asterisk result. Um, okay, I don't want to dig too much. That gives you kind of an overview of the auto steal, though, so that's good. 
So Cash is on second, nobody out, so we have a runner in scoring position. And so we will bring up Gene Kleins. So Gene Kleins here, you can see versus lefties. He has a number of 68. Not that I reference this first, I'm just showing you here. His auto hit number is 68. So we will roll all five dice again. And we have an 11 and a 1. Okay. So we go to Kleins versus lefties. Oh, we got a scoring position hit here. So we got an SG2 and a hyphen SPH, which means scoring position hit. And one thing I have not showed you is the game abbreviations card. Uh, this is essential when you first start out because you can just have it sitting inside instead of constantly referencing the rule book. Um, and on here, if I can get it to focus properly... You'll see SPH, and it'll say scoring position hit, use batter's scoring position hit chart when base when um, base situation is runners in scoring position. If not base, situ base situation, um, use the out given before the ask. So we do have, so if there wasn't a runner in scoring position right here, it would be a, a slow grounder. Um, but since there is, it's a scoring position hit automatically. No pitcher check on those. Uh, Kleins was excellent with runners in scoring position. He was a clutch hitter. So we would go to the back of the fly ball out page, flip it over. You go to the scoring position hit chart. You would use, you would, you're going to reroll. See up on top, you see the WBD. That means white, black die. I'll go over those right after this. So that means we would roll the white and black die, and it, it, there's no ORIG, there's no original in front of it. it means you have to re-roll. Um, if it had ORIG, you would use that original value of the white black. But in this instance, it's a scoring position hit. We're going to re-roll. We have a 66. Kleins was a weak first lefty power. And... Um, so if you go back over to the scoring position hit chart, you see the weak and a 66 is a home run. So even with weak power, you can have a weak power hitter get a, that's very, very rare. <laughs> it's the only chance you have on a weak hitter uh, with a home run is a 66 on a scoring position hit chart. I've probably seen that a couple of times in all the games I've played. So Kleins hit a home run, and if you want to know where it was hit, you look below, you say for the home run field description, if he's a right-handed batter, you use DF1. For left-handed batter, you use DF2. So Kleins is a right-handed batter. You use a DF1. And our red die value, you would go over, flip this back over. You would come over to the deep fly result chart. And a 1 means it went to left field. Uh, I'm sorry, I should look at front runners. So if runners and scoring position, they say the field's basically the same. But anyway, the scoring position, a 1 means it was hit to left field. One to six was left, seven to eight would have been to right, nine would have been to center. Again, using that red die value. Um, so uh, so that he hit a home run to left field. If you And then if you want to use the optional chart, which I do, uh, I would tell you, you want to see, okay, well, how far did that home run go? I take, I re-roll the red and the black. And you use the black to say, so it went to left field. A five means it went to left center. Um, and then a nine for how far it went. He is weak, so it was an average home run. It cleared the fence by six to 50 feet. Again, this is all optional. And once you get it down, you roll through this pretty quickly. All right. So let's do Roberto Clemente, and then we're gonna. I'm gonna stop here, and we'll do. I'm just gonna do a couple of gameplay examples. But we saw a scoring position hit, and this again. This is the game abbreviation. So this should be your best friend when you first start. It's a little. It's much smaller than a legal size page, and you'll. It will help until you get these memorized. 
um, to reference it as opposed to going to the rule book. So one more batter. I have a 50 way over there. 52 and a 6. And so if we go to Clementi versus a lefty, we have an SN1, a red SN1 result, um, which means we have a hit check. So then we want to grab the green die to see if Clementi has versus lefties. Um, he has a 59, which is outstanding. He hit three. He hit 370 versus lefties, and he has a 59 rating for an auto hit. And so the green die value was a 7, so it's a 76. So he hit a quality pitch. And now he's having a tough start here as they're getting some clutch hits. This team could hit. Um, so we have an S and 1 automatically. And a 6. S and 1, now we have the bases empty. An S and 1 and a 6 is a, whoops, Average single to center field. So he had an average single to center. Average difference away from the outfielder. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop with the gameplay example. So let's say that Clementi, instead of having a, a green seven, let's say he had a green three. So there was no auto hit. So then, since he failed this test, it wasn't greater than or equal to 59, right? So he failed that, so you would use the pitcher die value. <coughs> so since I already rolled it, as part of my original, it's a zero. So you would go to McNally's hit column versus righty, since Clemente's a right-handed hitter, look at the zero, and McNally would have blocked that result with a PU1. So there's his hit column, there's the PU1 versus righties. So that's the new play result. So a PU1... You would take the PU1 and the red 6 and go to the charts, go to PU1 with the bases empty, and it's a pop-up to the second basement. So although there's a lot of chart usage, something I want to um, stress here is although there's a lot of charts, you'll see that the charts are pretty easy to reference, especially once you get used to them. They're not all the, 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 the results aren't all clogged up. Um, and the ground balls are all seg segregated, pop-ups, etc. Um, I think you would find you're gonna find it very easy to reference, and you're gonna memorize a lot of these play result numbers. It'll take a few games, but pretty soon you're gonna know a GB2 and a four would be a ground ball to shortstop, or a GB2 and a six would be a ground ball to the second baseman. Um, and I also did the results, so like if you work your way around, the one I'm starting on the left side of the diamond for, for fly balls and ground balls. Um, it all starts on the left side of the diamond. Um, same thing with the hits. But So ones are all going to be to third base. Uh, and, on the, and on the fly balls, ones will all be to left field except for deep flies. Then you have to pay attention to one could be to right field if he was a left-handed hitter, basically. A DF2 would be... A left-handed hitter result. But on the normal flies, long flies, short flies, those ones would all be the left field. So you're going to memorize. There's definite patterns to this, and you would memorize those patterns. So it's not going to be that difficult. You'll have it all laid out in front of you. You won't have to be flipping the charts around, um, and especially if you keep the hits sitting up like that. One thing I wanted to go over a little bit more is on the charts, you'll see, like I was kind of, Showing you before, like here's a HD. So on a double play check, you're going to use the original green die value to see whether or not a double play was made using the base runner's rating into the fielder. And then it will have a range, and depending on the value, it will either be a double play or not. Um, so all the charts are going to tell you whether you're using what dice to use, uh, W, B, uh, R, G, white, black, red, green, and which ones you need. And then if it has an original in front of it, that means you don't need to re-roll. You're using that value. Um, I think that is it. I was just going to see if there's any more I can show you like that. So, oh, I know. I definitely want to show you an air check.
Okay, I'll show you an air check and then I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so an air check, we, the air check charts are over here. So what, what triggers an air check for the most part, 95% of the time, sometimes you'll get some off of wild plays or off of rare plays for the pitcher um, and then off of, on the catcher. But for the most part, you're going to be using, it's going to be this red die is going to show a 0E. That's going to say, okay, we have an air check happening here on your original roll. So when it's a 0E, <coughs> then you're going to use the green die to pick the fielder, the fielder row from when we go to the outs to see who's going to, who is the air check going to be. So let's say we have this three. Let's say Clemente has a, let's say against McNally, he had a 55. So we had an RG1. So we have a routine grounder. And we have a zero, I mean there's an air check. A three is the fielder, so we have an RG1. So we go to the GB, uh, GB column for all the ground balls are under the GB column. And you go to a, a GB1, and it's to the third baseman. Okay? So we're going to have an air check on the third baseman. Again, it was a zero E that, that got it. You look up the play result. We had an RG1. Um... And then we use the three, the green die value of three, to get the fielder. So then what you do is you go to the ground ball air check chart right here, and you will see that it shows, it come in a little bit better, it would be nice. It has WBG, it has original WBGD. So you're going to use your original roll, of the white, black, and green die to reference this chart. So we have let's we said it was a 55. So and then we have a three for the green die. So we have a 55 and a three is the value. So if we go back to the ground ball air check chart and we look up the 55 and the three, you would see it falls in between the 527 and the 557. This is the lower limits for each of these values. So it falls right here and it would take a value, the fielder would need to have a value of 19 or above, an air rating of 19 or above to not commit the air. So you can see right there the 53.7 and the 55.7. Our roll was 55.3, so it's less than the 55.7 but above the 52.7. So this would be the column. It would qualify in the 19, uh, the, a row, I'm sorry, it would qualify in the 19 row. So you're going to that, that this 19 value tells you it's going to take a fielder of with an error rated of 19 or greater to not commit an error. And again, it's to not commit an error. So you would look at, in this instance, we'd be looking at, when we look at the shortstop, we'd be looking at Belanger, let's say. So if we went to Belanger, I made a score sheet here. His error rating was 16. Um, actually, I'll pull it off the card for you. I've listed it on the chart, but let's show you on the card. So Belanger's